Well, I had about decided not to get the camera out because Kelly and I are having a fine, fine time in Maine, and I'm seeing beauty and color in, in uh, a woods environment I had never imagined. And they tell me that it's a dry and fairly colorless year, which staggers my imagination, but I was driving down the road and I saw the name of a street that piqued my imagination about timber frame, and so I went back and I drove up, and I showed up at uh, John Sweet's place. And there's his house. It's a beautiful timber frame. Spruce and hemlock in the bones. They've lived here for a long time. I've met his whole family. Kelly's in there right now. They've welcomed us with open arms. This is his truck. And right now I'm going to take you on a tour through his workshop, which is another sweet timber frame building. And uh, it's just, I, I, I've horned in on this guy and he's been very generous and uh, he's teaching me some things that I had only dimly perceived. So I'm gonna go in here, John. Is it okay, John, if we go into your shop? Is that oh, all right? Yeah. All right, Welcome. well, come on in. So this is John's shop. John, how long ago did you build this thing? I built this in uh, 1991, I believe it was. Wow. Uh, it's a 24 wide by 36 foot long, uh, four bent, three bay, timber frame structure, um, scribed together. Um, okay, scribed together means it's a tighter fit. Scribing is, the way of working with timbers that vary anywhere from seven and three quarters to eight and a half inch. Okay, it's when you so, can't, you cannot assume that the, that the dimension from the sawmill is the dimension you're anticipating, so you've got to fight every connection, right? But there are different methods, which I've learned over time, that work much more efficiently. Uh, the other method is called the square rule method, um, which I primarily use now for my newer frames, but Scribing is is a very effective way if you're one or two people and you can um, relate the differences in the thicknesses or widths or dimensions of a timber to the other person. So communication. Communication. You've got to be able to communicate on the exactly. job, on the fly. The other yes. guy knows exactly what the problem is. Exactly. It's like calling out sheetrock measurements. you got one guy in the scaffold, one be guy right in the on ground. Money. All right, so what this is, is a 12 foot eave on this or something? Uh, it's 12 foot ceiling and uh, and then above that, because it's a 12 pitch or 45 degree angle, uh -huh. is, a, is another, uh, it's uh, 24 feet wide, so it would be 12 feet high. Okay, And um, all right. So so let, let's let's walk through here, you give us a thumbnail sketch this, of these tools. This used to be my primary timber framing shop, but over time it became too small. So now it's my millwork shop. We build kitchens, cabinets, we build doors, we build whatever you want in here. And so you so you built this door? No, no. This okay. is a this is a Simpson store bought door. Okay, all right. We're we're setting it up. And okay, uh, got it. And put the finish on there correct. and everything. Some things don't make sense to build. I mean, there are some right, things exactly. that make sense to build yep. and some things that don't. So let's do this. Let me walk through here and just kind of give sure. you a walk through and get you a look at these tools and what has become his mill workshop for a, a sweet timber frame <laughs> operation. How about that? John Sweet. I mean, that, that's a company name that was just made from the beginning, right? All right, so let, let's walk around here. And it saw. All right, we got a good old Delta Unisaw with a Beesmeyer fence. Um, got a nice roll case. There's a, a Grizzly that goes on the job site when we're working out in the field. Okay, um, got to have something you can carry. How, how big a bandsaw is that? That's a 14 inch. Big enough for everything you got to do. Yep. Here so, so you've got it on rollers. You can kind of roll that around inside a cut. Every, everything in here is mobile. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Very important. And, uh, so, what am I looking at here? This pile of parts and pieces. What, what is this that we're looking at? We built a timber frame for uh, Clinton Kippy over in uh, West Tremont, and uh, we never finished out the stairs. And uh, this is the platform for the stairs to come around and into the room. Kind of a, a landing. We're gonna exactly. We're okay. gonna put this landing in place here next week and um, this is all spruce and uh, this is all square rule uh, joinery. Look at that. Got the, got the holes drilled for the trunnels, locking the tenons this, into the mortises. This piece will fit. This will turn over and fit into here and this is all this has been reduced to I believe uh, three inches by uh, um, Three and a half inches. Okay, so that chamfer is going to be part of the of the decoration. The, yes. The, yeah. That that, that reveal. Be, it'll only be in that much. Yep. 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 So that that reveal becomes 
kind of an ornament. Correct. And it reduces the labor. To get yes. a net zero fit, so you get a double bonus. Okay, they, these are the diagonal braces. These are, instead of holding it up this underneath, from underneath, they'll be upside down and it will be hanging. Oh, so one's in tension. Tension is a big part of that. They're, they're, they're both going to be okay. in tension. Okay, all right. So I see that the holes for the, for the dowel are not drilled. These are drilled in place so that you got a full fit up before the dowel is because penetrated. It's, because it's an older frame and uh, the differences between the older frame, uh, you cannot get it exactly right until mm -hmm. you're there yep. putting it up. This is a Delta Shaper. Uh, we make stair parts, full nosing for, um, for stair treads and uh, any, any kind of thing we need to shape. So a shaper is a kind of a scary instrument sometimes, right? It can be. Look at the head on that thing. Wow. This is a uh, drill focusing. You, you uh, put that on the timber and you drill a straight hole. Yeah, you know, a guy back in the Midwest sent me one of those from the 1800s where you sit on it and you got a crank on each side. In fact, I think we've got a video <laughs> that's of that. That's the hard way to go. Yes, that's the hard way to go. And what do we, this is a square uh, hole mortiser, right? This is, this is a uh, um, Makita. 7305L hollow chisel mortising machine. These are pretty rare because, uh, well, they, they never shipped them across to the United States. They were, I had to purchase this from a friend of mine in Korea and uh, he shipped this over to me. But uh, I think now you can buy them on uh, eBay. And, uh, but these are very handy tools. They uh, cut an almost clean pocket um, that you don't have to clean up um, nice. versus a chain mortiser where it's a rounded bottom and it, you know, it's just messy. Yeah. So I'm, so I'm assuming that at Japan, that those things are in existence because they do a lot of timber frame also for, yes, these are still available. I believe, um, I don't know if they've discontinued making this model or, or what, what the story is, but, uh, they're, they're difficult to get here in the United States. So as I've been driving, Kelly and I've been driving up and down the road, we came up highway one, you know, from Boston pretty much out to Mount Desert Island. Acadia National Park is right here. I mean, they're neighbors. These people live within a, you know. Uh, right outside the window is Acadia National okay, Park. Okay, I mean, a, a, a slingshot. You could shoot into Acadia National Park. But one of the things that has just been like a burr under my saddle is I cannot identify any of these species here on the East Coast. And I can identify most species on the West Coast. So John, what species do you build these things out of? Uh, primarily, um, Hemlock, spruce, and pine. And, th and these are East Coast varieties correct. of what I'm used to back there. Correct. And every once in a while we get a call for uh, uh, Douglas fir, which is um, from the West Coast, and you've got to pay shipping, so the cost, of course, goes up. So you know how I feel about Douglas fir. I've bragged about it before, and I'll brag about it again. So it's a premium product, isn't it? Um, maybe not so on the West Coast, but here on the East Coast, very premium product. Yeah. Yeah, and the prices that he, John was relating to me for the Douglas fir brought out here, I mean, I'm used to paying what I have thought has been an inflated price, but I'm not feeling bad about it anymore, and I just think, man, I would hate to be buying the Douglas fir beams that you've got to buy back well, here. Well, the, the shipping just drives it, yeah. drives it right out. Through it's the incredible. roof. incredible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can buy uh, up to 24 foot long, 8 by 16, 8 by 12, um, nice timbers, um, box tar uh, from Parker Lumber, which is about 80, 90 miles north of Bangor, Maine. And uh, they ship them down here. They deliver tractor trailer load. I rent a JCB forklift and unload the trailer in five or six hours and then uh, shake it out and then bring individual timbers into my big shop. And uh, we uh, slice and dice, cut the length through the mortise and tenons. And uh, when it's all complete, load it back up onto a, a, a building supply boom truck and then take it to the site, unload it, assemble it, and uh, raise it up. So that, that's a lot of work. I mean, there is a reason that, that timber frame costs more. It's because it is a ton of labor. It's like blacksmithing, right? I mean, the rule of thumb in carpentry is that labor equals material. I have to assume that's not even close in timber frame. Uh, it's two to one. Two to one. Yeah. And in blacksmithing, you know, 10% of the blacksmith project is a material or less, and 90% is labor, so it's on that same continuum that the more handwork is involved, and thus the more beauty 
the more it's bound to cost. Exactly. So John and I were talking about the, you know, whatever advantage a skill saw is when I'm banging together two by six walls, some of these power tools are a much greater advantage if I would even, you know, pose that as a possibility when you're working with these big beams and digging these pockets and making these tenons. But even with all that being true, you've still got to use, am I right, a chisel, a slick, a mallet, some hand tools. What right. have you got here? So this is a, a bar from Bar B A R R Tools from McCall, Idaho. This guy probably makes the best uh, timber framing chisels in the world, I would say. And it's very sharp, and uh, we put a uh, leather sheath on it to protect ourselves primarily and the blade. Sure. sure. And uh, so, what makes that that much better than some of the competition? What just what the, makes it the, better? The steel. Yeah. He, he plies together different types of steel. Oh, so that's a type of Damascus. That, that's a type correct, of, of, of welded. He's, okay. he's got different layers uh -huh. of steel so that your edge is, uh, is going to be able to take, a, take an edge. I'm going to I'm gonna test that. It's very sharp. That is sharp. And I can see a couple weld lines in there. Yeah, he's... Uh, Isn't that interesting? This guy's mastered his craft. And uh, he's online and he... Has uh, he has really come to the front as far as timber framing tools for, for as far as hand tools? Hand tools. And, so uh, it's interesting. I, I've asserted and probably will continue to assert that Damascus steel, pattern welded steel, is entirely for aesthetics. And in the world of blades, you know, uh, knives and swords, I've got to say that's true. But here's a case where welding different alloys together in different thicknesses achieves a better tool, a more useful tool, and that, frankly, is energizing for a blacksmith to hear. The Japanese would make their chisels the same method, and mm -hmm. this is derived from that method. So what I'm patting right here is an 8 by 16 hemlock, pretty much free of heart. You said that's 24 feet, 20 feet? 22. 22 feet. That's a heavy chunk. That's probably weighing 800 pounds. No, it's not that much, but it's heavy. It's heavy enough. They're all heavy. Look at that. Yeah. Two more right there. And hemlock is somewhat rot resistant, yes? Yeah. This is called ring shake. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. I don't know if you heard that, but he pointed that out. This is a defect that plagues hemlock on the West Coast, too. Ring shake. In the, um, in the West, the Scaling Bureau teaches us to call that wind shake more than ring shake. It can also happen when it's when it's fallen, if a big tree takes a real impact when it uh, hits the ground, but doesn't quite shatter, you can get some shake in between the rings. This is a 28 by 42. 28 by 42. Same 12 foot ceiling. Hemlock frame. Hemlock frame instead of spruce. Beautiful. That's a... What's that, an 8 by... 8 by uh, 12 piece of spruce because they couldn't get hemlock that long at that time. But everything else is hemlock. And this shop is heated by wood. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's John. Cedar door, hemlock frame. Nice. Listen to that, ladies and gentlemen. So among the things that I've heard about and never been up close to that are part of John's program here, is this wood-fired gasification yeah. boiler to heat the zones with radiant heat in the concrete floor I'm standing on. And in the upstairs, he's got some uh, radiators that also use it. So, John, you told me that you put 18 to 20 pieces. See, this is a piece of beech. Can you see that? That's about 22 inches long. That's only 18. 18. Well, see, there you go. My calibration breaks down the further east I get. But he puts 18 to 20 pieces in there, and it'll heat this and that for how long? Three, four days in the side seasons. 
three or four days, but not in the bitter cold. In the bitter cold, cold I fire it up probably once a day. Once Depending a day. Depending on the weather. If so so think about zero. that. If you burn wood, you know that 18 to 20 pieces of stove wood that size is not much when you're shoveling it into a wood stove as fast as you can, like I always did. And then the leftover heat that you were talking about. It goes into the 806 gallons of water storage tank. There are copper, copper coils in here. And okay. The boiler is transferring the heat into the water, and mm -hmm. the water holds the heat. And, and then as it's called for, it comes back out of here. It pulls the heat back, and it's stored it's in the 800 gallons. It yep. pulls it back out to keep it warm in here for another day or yep. day and a half. Either the, the radiant floor uh, zone here or the radiators upstairs. Wow. So one of the things I'm going to do when I get home is show Phil Rokas this array. Look at that. You would find that on the Starship Enterprise, I think. And uh, it's just beautifully done. The sweated joints are all beautiful. He wiped them off. Everything is square, plumb, and true. So these people have just stopped their day so we can do this, and I have just seen some wonderful things. We're going to go upstairs in this big building first, and then we're going to take a little walk through some of his forest here, and he's going to show me what some big wood looks like on the East Coast. I'm going to go upstairs first, though. So there's something I had never thought of or seen, and that is that rafters on a timber frame do not simply butt, but it's called tongue and fork? Correct. Okay, tell us about a tongue and fork. One is the fork, or the tongue yeah. that goes into the fork. Okay, and then a trenel, a dowel, a tree nail, goes right through. Through, all, through both. Wow. Let me walk down here and see if you can see that. Probably see it best from, if you turn around. Pretty neat. Are those pine tongue and groove decking boards? No, that's spruce. Spruce. Insulation over the top in a panel of some kind. Right. Three inches on the outside and then another layer of uh, boarding boards and then cedar shingles. The difference between scribe timber framing and square roll timber framing. Um, this is a eight by eight. It's probably uh, actually seven and seven eighths. But we, we, we took it to a numerical constant of seven and a half. Now this is a 8 by 10. We took that to a numerical constant of 9.5. And, a half. and uh, the same with the diagonal braces, pockets, and um, everything is mathematically correct. Fits so regardless of what happened when the, when the beam was being cut, the joinery is always going to fit. Correct. John, tell me about that book. Well, this is my Bible. I mean, this is where I learned I cut this little frame that Jack Saban wrote about. He did his doctoral thesis for architecture on this little uh, uh, Shaker Hancock um, 16 by 12 uh, building in, at the Hancock Shaker Museum in Massachusetts. Uh, Jack Saban's his name. And uh, he, uh, he wrote this book and he explains in detail how to do square rule joinery. And uh, I can show you some... And not only in detail, but in terms you can understand. Correct. The layman can understand it. Um, he's taking the timber to a numerical constant. And mm -hmm. where it fits in the corresponding timber, that timber is also taken to a numerical constant. Same with the diagonal braces. This is all seven, 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 seven. So everything fits. Precise. I can see that you that you took his uh, guidance to heart. This looks exactly like what I'm looking at here in your shops. I mean, I looked at all the different timber framing books. Ted Benson's a very good craftsman, but he uh, he didn't explain it like Jack Saban does, and uh, I didn't really learn the method methodology until I built the frame that he built um, for another person up here. So. Kelly and I just want to personally thank again Ann and John Sweet and Daisy. They just rolled out the red carpet to perfect strangers. And I'm leaving here inspired and educated and uh, feeling right at home. So thank you, John. Yes, sir. Very thank you. Much. Pleasure to... Just as soon as we stepped out of the back of John's big shop, we were walking on Acadia National Park in an East Coast conifer grove. And it was beautiful. 
The pine and the hemlock and spruce trees were similar to those that I grew up with in the Oregon Cascade Mountains, but not exactly the same. Sort of like first cousins, I guess you could say. What a pleasure it has been to meet a man and a family that are so deeply part of and intimately connected with their part of the country and the trees that grow there. I really hope that one of these days, that one of these days, John and Ann can make the trip out to Oregon because I would really like to show them our pines and hemlocks and spruce trees and maybe even some of the Douglas fir that I love so much. And I think he probably will go home with a little different idea of what big trees look like. Thank you for watching Essential Craftsman and keep up the good work.